We'll send our children on back to Children's Church. Thank you for those of you who are working this morning. What an awesome song. It, it's, you know, it's not a real complicated, but I just love the visual imagery of God's grace covering us. This morning, I invite you to take your Bible and reopen to Ephesians chapter 2. And as we do, let's pray together. Father, we are thankful today for your grace in our lives. And we ask that as we come to the scripture today, that you would give us insight and understanding of what that means and how that we might live uh, in the awareness of your grace. Thank you, Lord, for being a God who loves us. And thank you for being a God who is rich in mercy. And thank you, Lord, for uh, so many other of your attributes that the scripture reveals. Lord, today we come before you and we recognize our need for you. And uh, Lord, we just bow before you to thank you for what an awesome God that you are. I pray the Holy Spirit would illumine our minds and hearts through your written word, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. What would you say to someone who said they wanted you to describe your parents to them? How would you answer that question? What if they asked that about your children or your grandchildren? How would you describe your husband or your wife to somebody who had never met your spouse? Now, that may seem kind of like a strange question, but your answer in part would reveal how well you know them. So what then would you say to someone who said, tell me what God is like? How, how long would that conversation actually be? You know, there's a difference between knowing about someone and knowing them. One knowledge uh, one is based on information, the other is based on an intimacy. One is more academic, the other is actual. One is a, a perceived knowledge, and the other is a personal knowledge. To really know someone means to have a personal relationship with them, and how well we know them may also be an indicator of how close that relationship is. Now, my experience is that relationships, just in general, don't remain static, they change because people change. And I don't mean that necessarily in a negative context. People uh, grow and they develop and they mature. And when you think about it, that's really isn't that really the good news of the Christian life? That if any person is in Christ, they are a new creation and old things pass away and new things come. I am so grateful to the Lord that we don't have to stay who we are in Jesus like we were before we met Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul in this text today begins by telling us who we were and he says and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest Listen, if, if you're a Christian, your reasons for not living an abundant, victorious Christian life are really kind of flimsy. And by abundant, I'm not talking about uh, or promoting a prosperity gospel unless by prosperity you mean growing in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God's power has already granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. So when a sister in Jesus Christ sort of explains away her problem with anger because she's of a specific ethnic background, or a brother in Christ defends his immoral behavior because he has needs he says he can't control, they are denying that God's power is enough for them to have victory. And that, sadly, is not true. Now, I know I've gone a little off track here, but like the Christian life, which is meant to be a process of growth, of becoming more like Jesus, relationships with people also are an ongoing, growing thing. And knowing a person can be a continual discovery. It reminds me of the wife who was explaining the meeting of 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 7, to her husband, where Peter says that we husbands, 
in the same way are to live with our wives in an understanding way. And she said, your job is to figure me out. And my job is to keep you guessing. Well, while it's good for a husband to figure out his wife, to know her, there's another relationship of knowing someone that's even more critical. In his prayer to his father in the upper room, the Lord Jesus prayed these words. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Did you catch that? Eternal life comes from a relationship of knowing God and Jesus. It doesn't come from religion. It doesn't come from good works. It doesn't come from any human effort or merit. Some of the most chilling words in the Bible, at least to me they're chilling, Jesus spoke towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what he said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and did we not in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and I will declare to them, now listen, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Getting to heaven is not essentially about what you do. It's about who you know. Or maybe more pointedly, it's about who knows you. In the old Roger and Hammerstein's musical, The King and I, Anna sings this song, getting to know you, getting to know all about you, getting to like you, getting to hope you like me, getting to know you, putting it my way, but nicely, you are precisely my cup of tea. Getting to know you, getting to feel free and easy when I am with you, getting to know what to say. Haven't you noticed suddenly I'm bright and breezy because of all the beautiful and new things I'm learning about you day by day? Now listen, this song is not a statement of theology. It was never meant to be. But when it comes to our relationship with God, there's something about the spirit of this song that captures the desire and the goal of what it means to be a Christian, and that is getting to know God. So this morning, we're going to begin a series on the attributes of God, or some of the attributes of God, entitled Knowing God, which is not an original title. In fact, J.I. Packer wrote a book by the same title. But I want you to know that the God of the Bible can be known. He reveals himself. He's made himself known through the creation. He's made himself known through his written word. And he's made himself known ultimately and completely in Jesus Christ. It is an incredible prospect that, that God, who is the creator of the world, is a relational being who wants us to know him and to know him deeply. In fact, we can come to know him in, in a relationship by which we can actually call him Father. God spoke to his people through the prophet Jeremiah, and this is what he said. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man of his might, nor let the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. The God of the Bible is revealed not only by what he does, but he's revealed by who he is, by characteristics, and we call these characteristics attributes. An attribute is a, a, a characteristic or a quality that describes who God is. You know, there are several personality inventories and strengths tests available today that you can take and based on your responses or your answers to the questions they presumably identify certain characteristics about you to help you to describe or to assess your personality god doesn't need to take a strengths test to assess his personality but in a way what the bible teaches about god could be considered the results of God's personality profile. If I want to know about God, I can go to the scripture and it will tell me who he is, what he is like. Now, I was curious as to know if there was consensus 
on how many attributes of God there are in the Bible. And just to give you an idea, the lists range from 7 to 17 to 100. So no, there is not. Whatever the exact number of attributes are in the Bible, they still don't provide a complete understanding of who God is because God is greater than what can be expressed in a written word. I heard a pastor once say, has God told us everything there is to know about him in the Bible? And he said the answer is no. But what has he told us? Has he told us enough that we can believe him and trust in him and give our lives to him? And the answer is yes. And that pastor may be correct. Theologians generally divide the attributes of God into those that are personally his, that he does not share with anyone else. Those are called his incommunicable attributes. And then those attributes that you and I as his creation can possess, called his communicable attributes. For example, only God is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-present. Granted, I've run into some folks who thought they were all-knowing, but they're not. He is unchangeable and eternal. His communicable attributes are those he shares with us. Attributes of God that we can possess, like uh, in a finite sense, like love and mercy and grace and forgiveness and patience and long-suffering and holiness and faithfulness and goodness. So when we come to the subject of the attributes of God, where in the world do you begin? Well, this morning we've been singing about grace. So why don't we just start there? God is a God of grace. That means his character, his nature is gracious. He is a gracious person. In fact, the Bible says that he is rich in grace. God has a wealth of grace, which he lavishes upon us. So maybe a good question is, well, what is grace? And I know, you know, we're not talking about someone's name or the blessing that's offered before eating a meal. Grace is one of those words that expresses beauty and generosity and goodness. In the Old Testament, there were several words that we translate into English as grace, but the most common meaning was to have favor, to implore, to to show compassion. The prophet Nehemiah wrote, but you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. In the New Testament, the word grace has a double meaning. It can also mean beauty and charm and attractiveness, uh, but it can also mean something and, and something that's lovely and delightful. But it also is an expression of kindness and favor and friendliness. So when it comes to understanding what we mean by grace this morning, just let me give you a couple words. Unmerited favor. Grace is God's unmerited favor, which means that he gives to us that which we do not deserve and that which we cannot earn. It has been said that justice is getting what you deserve, mercy is not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting what you don't deserve. This may not be a great illustration, um, but if you received a $290 speeding ticket plus five points on your license, which, if, if my research is correct, meant in Maryland you were exceeding the posted speed limit by more than 20 miles per hour or more, and you decided to go to the court, you need to know this, that that $290 amount can change, up or down. But if you went to court and the judge heard your case and decided to fine you the $290 and keep the five points on your record, you would have received justice. It doesn't feel like justice, but you got what you deserved. If, however, the judge didn't lower the fine, but he reduced the points to one, you would have received mercy. But if the judge took away all of your points, dismissed the fine, and then stood up, took out his or her wallet, opened it up, and then gave you $290 for just coming to court? That's grace. You see, the emphasis on grace is not just that it's a gift, 
but it's, that, it's a gift that's unmerited, undeserved, and unsought. It is God giving us blessing or good that we do not deserve. Grace is God's love in action towards people who deserve the opposite of his love. It's his favor to those who are under condemnation. And getting a handle on God's grace is not just important theologically, but it's important practically. One pastor said, Christianity cannot be understood apart from an adequate grasp of grace. The doctrine of grace distinguishes the Christian faith from every other religion in the world as well as from the cults. So to appreciate God's grace, we need to understand why he gives it and why we need it. Well, we need it because far more serious than a speeding ticket, and by we, I mean all of us, the entire human race, including you and me, we need it because we've sinned against God and broken his law. We're sinners who cannot atone for our own sin. We are debtors who cannot pay a debt. We are lost and we cannot find our way. And in the text that we read this morning, we are spiritually dead and cannot make ourselves alive. So if we received justice, we would all die eternally because the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, and the wages of sin is death. But what we cannot do for ourselves, God does for us. He gives us grace. What does that grace look like? A couple quick thoughts. God's grace is a saving grace. Now, in this passage that Peter read for us, we skip down to verses 8 and 9. And very familiar verses, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one should boast. Notice that it's not faith that saves us, it's grace. Faith plays a part, but God's grace saves us. He doesn't have to save any of us. He is totally and completely just. And in his justice, he could and should rightfully send all of us to hell. But because of his great love for us, he gives us grace. The whole point of God's grace is that it is this gift that he gives. The most, or at least one of the most well-known verses in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God did not give a formula. He did not give a religion. He did not give a path to follow. He gave us Jesus, his one and only completely unique son. Now, people may disagree uh, and say that all roads lead to heaven. They may debate and argue and disagree, reject what the Bible says. But this verse says, God gave his son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God has provided us a way, but it only comes from having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, if we could earn salvation, then it really wouldn't be grace. God gives saving grace, and a particular benefit of this saving grace is forgiveness. In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul says of Jesus that in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Forgiveness, by the way, is another attribute of God that we'll consider later. But notice that in Christ, we are given forgiveness. The Apostle John wrote, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for you for his name's sake. Well, what does that mean? Whose name is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the name above all names. The name at which of Jesus that every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, Paul wrote uh, later in this book in Ephesians, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ, has forgiven you. By the way, if you've never memorized this verse, Ephesians 4, 32, you should do it today or this week. Because not only does it instruct us on how to treat one another, 
It tells us how and why we are forgiven. For just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Maybe we just ought to stop and think about that for a second. The reason our sins are forgiven is because of Jesus. Even his name, Jesus, reflects both his person and his mission. Do you remember at the Christmas story when Joseph was considering divorcing his wife? That the angel came to him and said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And went on to explain the situation and he said to Joseph that uh, Mary would bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. You'll call his name Yahshua, Yeshua. You shall call his name God saves because he will save his people from his sins. That's what the name Jesus means. And then Paul says that there's salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven that has been given by which men must be saved. Our sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. God's grace gives us forgiveness. It is saving grace. God's grace is also sustaining grace. In other words, God gives us grace to live the Christian life. I mentioned last week when we were talking about in golf about mulligans and do-overs and I, I said last week that if salvation meant that God forgave us for everything that we had ever done when we came to faith in Jesus he wiped the slate clean and we got to start all over again that that would be more than we deserve but if he left it up to us to live a perfect life or to maintain our salvation we'd all be in trouble even if we could live perfectly from that point on which we can't, but even if we could, then salvation would not be a matter of grace. It would be a matter of grace and works. Now, it is accurate to say that we are sinners saved by grace. Three years ago, I went for my uh, yearly medical checkup that I hadn't had in two years and uh, was told as a result from an EKG that I had AFib. To which I responded, what is that? Uh, AFib or atrial fibrillation is the most common form of an abnormal heartbeat. In fact, I told someone earlier this morning, I actually felt better before I found out that I had it than after I found out that I had it. AFib occurs when your heart's two upper chambers don't beat in regular rhythm. And I've never confessed to being a person of rhythm, but it's really important to have it in your heart. And so what happens, it causes the lower chamber to pump blood too quickly. And when that happens, um, it can't, the heart can't deliver oxygen-rich blood to your body. And one of the potential dangers of AFib, in fact, of, of, of most heart disease or heart problems, is that you could form a clot, which would be very dangerous. Now, that's probably more information about my personal health than you wanted to know. But I need to finish this illustration. So I had a procedure done where it's very quick, very short, and they shock you uh, back into rhythm. And I had that procedure done, and my heart was in rhythm for three years until this past Father's Day when it went back into AFib. I had the procedure done again. My heart is in rhythm. I am developing a new discipline in my life. Every single morning, one of the first things I do is I have a little gizmo where I can take an EKG, I check my heart, and when I see the words normal sinus rhythm, I do two things. I say, thank you, Lord, for giving me another day of being in rhythm, and while I'm at it, I want to dedicate my life to you today for your purpose. So I'm using available technology to check so today, my heart's in rhythm. If you were to ask me, Pastor, do you have AFib? I'm required to say, yes, I do. Even though I'm not in AFib, I have AFib. Because once AFib, always AFib. Once you're a sinner, you're always a sinner. You can't say, I'm not a sinner anymore. What you can say is, I'm a sinner, but I'm a saved sinner. We all are. 
And because we are sinners, and because, as Paul put it, I know nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not, then we need, I want to underscore need, God's grace day by day to live as his children. If you still have your Bible open there in Ephesians 2, go back to verse 4. Paul says you're dead in your trespasses and sins, and then you get to verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Believers don't just receive life, they receive resurrection life. Now, that may not be the greatest grammar, but notice that we are made alive with, raised with, and seated with. You know, you're not supposed to end a sentence with a preposition. So let me be a little more accurate. We are made together alive with Christ. We are raised up with him, and we're seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What an awesome statement about your identity in Jesus Christ. You are completely identified in him and with him. And all of these phrases describe our intimate uh, union with Jesus. And that's not only good grammar, that's really good theology too. See, grace not only affects our past, it affects our present as well. And that God's grace is available every day of our lives. And my suspicion is that we probably sometimes fail to see or recognize or even understand God's grace at work in our lives. God's grace enables us to live as children of God. It's through his grace that we find strength and assistance when we have to navigate through the challenges of life. So what does God's sustaining grace mean? Let me just give you a couple thoughts. We live in freedom by God's grace. Paul says in Romans 6, verse 14, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. God's grace can enable us to live in victory over sin in our life. Two, we grow spiritually by grace. Peter wrote, But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove in vain, for I labored more than all of them, but not I, but the grace of God with me. Do you know that we serve the Lord by his grace? Paul says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Ephesians says, But to each one of us, grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Our needs are are met by grace. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. We're provided power through grace. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to God in prayer through grace. The author of Hebrews says, therefore, we are to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we can have victory over our struggles and our issues of life through God's grace. A very familiar passage, and we won't go into all of it now, is is the passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul asks God to remove some really major difficulty in his life that we call a thorn in the flesh from him. We don't know exactly what it was, but whatever it was, there was at least three occasions in which Paul prayed that God would remove this from his life. And honestly, God essentially said no. And then God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul is praying, Lord, remove this thorn, remove this spike from my life. And God says, no, because my grace is sufficient. My grace is continually sufficient. 
My grace will always be sufficient every moment, every day. Paul, there's never going to be a time in your life when my grace isn't enough. And can I say to you this morning, there will never be a time in your life when God's grace is not sufficient. So what was Paul's response? Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ might dwell in me. God's grace will meet every need that you have. You probably, uh, maybe you've heard the first line of this poem, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Um, that's the first line of the first stanza. Uh, this poem is by an unknown author. And the poem actually says this, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you, where the arms of God cannot support you, where the riches of God cannot supply your needs, and where the power of God cannot endow you. The will of God will never take you where the Spirit of God can't work through you, where the wisdom of God cannot teach you, where the army of God cannot protect you, where the hands of God cannot mold you. The will of God will never take you where the love of God cannot enfold you, where the mercies of God cannot sustain you, where the peace of God cannot calm your fears, where the authority of God cannot overrule you. The will of God will never take you where the comfort of God cannot dry your tears, where the word of God cannot feed you, where the miracles of God cannot be done for you, and where the omnipresence of God cannot find you. God is a God of saving grace, and he's a God of sustaining grace. And then just one other thought this morning, God's grace is a securing grace. Because salvation is God's gift and not a result of works, because it's God's doing and not ours, his grace secures us. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. The Apostle Peter wrote, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Some of you might be familiar with the name John Newton, who's credited with writing the words to a song that we're going to sing in just a minute or two, Amazing Grace, one of the most beloved songs of the church. Now, if you've never read his life uh, and about coming to faith in Jesus, I would highly recommend that you, you Google it. I encourage you to do so. But there are a few things that I would want you to know this morning. Uh, Newton had a godly mother who faithfully taught him the truths of Scripture, encouraged him to memorize the Bible when he was very young. But she died when he was 11 years old. And so he left home to go to boarding school. That didn't last a long time. And so he became a seaman on the high seas and soon after a slave trader. Despite his mother's godly influence, Newton shunned his religious upbringing and he descended into the depths of sin, sinking as deep as he could possibly allow. He was an obscene man given to fighting, insubordination, drinking, and the vilest kinds of immorality. His lust ran unchecked. And he later said this of himself, I not only sinned with a high hand to myself, but it made it my study to tempt and seduce others upon every occasion. Newton was a mess. And his behavior towards his crew and salvation, and the, his behavior to his crew and his slaves on board was despicable. Now again, I'll encourage you to read some more about Newton. But John Newton, the vile, disgusting, morally obscene slave trader, gave his life to Jesus while he was still a slave trader. He left the straight slave trade eventually, and many years later he became an ally of William Wilberforce, leader of the parliamentary campaign to abolish the African slave trade. Uh, and as an old man, uh, four years before his death, he actually lived to see the passage of the British Slave Trade Act of 1807, which enacted this event. In a small cemetery 
of a parish churchyard in Alney, England, there's a granite tombstone with this following inscription. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and a libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had so long labored to destroy. Again, perhaps we know him because of these words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Again, we're going to sing this in just a second, but some time ago, I observed something in this uh, hymn um, and how Newton develops the theme of grace that I had not seen before. Now, there are different versions of the, of the text of the song, so this morning I'm going to appeal to the 1991 Baptist hymnal. Amazing, first verse, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. These verses describe God's saving grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. This grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Those verses describe God's sustaining grace. And then, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Those verses describe God's securing grace. There are some people who may wonder that when Newton wrote the phrase, saved a wretch like me, that he was using hyperbole or being a little overdramatic, but Newton did not think so. In fact, he said, I see no reason why the Lord singled me out for mercy unless it was to show by one astonishing instance that with him, nothing is impossible. You know what? That could be said of each of us. Let's look back at the text just one more time, verse 7. Paul is describing what God does and he makes us alive and he seats us with Christ in the heavenly places. And in verse 7 he says, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God demonstrates for himself to his cosmic audience the wonders of his gracious generosity. I like how the Life Application Bible Commentary put it. It is as if someone asked God, how can I be sure you are as loving and gracious as you say you are? His response is simply to display the church. Flawed, sinful, capable of stupidity and faithlessness, as exhibit A. Demonstrating his infinite patience and mercy. How else would a group of such obviously fallen men and women get together and do anything for the glory of God? Who else but God would use people like us? You are a display case for the grace of God. Demonstrate his great kindness to you by sharing it with others. Use grace in your relationship with other people. We who are grace givers, uh, grace receivers, are to also be grace givers. 